I'm Benjamin Schwartz. I'm a national editor at the American Conservative, and uh, I'm delighted to moderate uh, the first panel this morning. Uh, we have a collection of uh, extremely distinguished speakers. Um, alas, uh, John Lanchowski uh, uh, just heard there's an emergency that he has to take care of. He may be joining us uh, later in uh, the panel. Uh, so I'm going to begin uh, by introducing our, our speakers. Uh, to my left is uh, William Ruger. Uh, he's vice president uh, for research at the Charles Koch Institute. He was previously a professor at Texas State University and is the author of a biography of Milton Friedman. He's a veteran of the Afghanistan war. Corey, uh, Corey Shockey is research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, she was the senior foreign policy advisor to the McCain-Palin campaign. Uh, and before that, she was deputy director for policy planning in the State Department. She was director for defense strategy and requirements at the National Security Council. And uh, my colleague, Dan, Dan Larison. Uh, Dan is a senior editor at the American Conservative where he keeps a solo blog. Uh, he's also a columnist for The Week, and he holds a PhD in history from the University of Chicago. Uh, so, uh, Will, I'd like you to, to start, if, if, if you would. No problem, and uh, thank you uh, to the American Conservative for having me and uh, for joining us this morning. So the title of this panel is Conservative Realism and Restraint, What's the Right Foreign Policy? And I'm going to flip this, the script a little bit to start us off. So instead of answering the question by offering a full-blown right foreign policy in either sense of the word, I'm going to set others up for that by talking about what the wrong conservative foreign policy is and why it is so problematic. In short, the wrong approach to foreign policy, in my view, is our status quo approach of primacy. Uh, this also goes under names like what Barry Posen calls it, liberal hegemonialism or the Roman option, if you want to be historic, uh, or what its advocates Robert Kagan and Bill Kristol have called a foreign policy of benevolent global hegemony. It sounds so kind. <laughs> now, this has been the foreign policy the US has pursued since at least the end of the Cold War, and we could talk about how further back that might go, but at least since the end of the Cold War, primacy has been the US's approach. Now, the reason it is wrong is that it is expensive, it's counterproductive, it is unnecessary and doesn't make us safer, and it, it is ill-fitting for a liberal republic, and it is unsustainable. And I think it's also inconsistent with conservatism. So let me tell you what primacy is in more detail before explaining why it is so problematic. And I'll try to be most fair to primacy here in my description. So primacy is a muscular foreign policy aimed at preserving and extending America's hegemonic position in the international system. And as Barry Posen of MIT has, has noted, primacists believe that this preponderance of US power, as he put it, will ensure global peace. In essence, it's a strategy of active engagement designed to structure the international environment in a manner favorable to US interests and values. And it has this notion that US interests and values are coterminous with global goods. Namely, they have a very broad definition of the, natural, of the national interest that's well beyond what traditionally has been thought of as falling into that category. Now, for the primacists, this means that the United States has to lead and lead from the front, not from behind. It also means a long list of alliance commitments, a large and expensive military that can meet a lot of contingencies around the globe, and an active policy of spreading liberal values abroad even if that necessitates military intervention and regime change, as it did in Iraq, Libya, and Syria, if certain folks had their way. So for primacists, you must take the lead in, as Crystal and Kagan put it, resisting and, where possible, undermining rising dictators and hostile ideologies. Now, it's telling that primacists like Kagan and Crystal have noted that the challenges of the world will sometimes require military intervention abroad, quote, even when we cannot prove that a narrowly construed vital interest of the United States is at stake, unquote. That's pretty radical. 
It also means that the United States must thwart peer competitors, meaning uh, smothering essentially Russian and Chinese attempts uh, to increase their power. Uh, and it also means filling vacuums of power with American might, therefore expanding NATO and making sure to stay engaged in places like the Middle East. So what's wrong with this approach? Well, the problem with this vision is that it actually undermines that which it claims to provide, American security and safety, not to mention those precious US values. And I say this despite being a pretty hardcore realist, meaning that I'm no dove or naive believer that international law or international institutions can substitute for power. Instead, I think that the anarchic international system is a self-help system where states must secure themselves in a dangerous world or risk their independence. Therefore, I do think that the United States should remain the greatest power on earth with a robust military, especially in terms of our naval and air forces. But I do think that primacy undermines our safety, our security, and our liberty. So why do I think this? Well, first of all, like I said, it's expensive. It's expensive in terms of blood and treasure. And if you're a reader of the American conservative, people like Dan are talking about this all the time. And it's very important to understand that this is, comes at great cost, this strategy. 7,000 American soldiers were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. There were $4 trillion spent on these two wars with few gains. And if you look at interest costs out to 2054, we're talking about $8 trillion. And the DOD annual budget is over a half a trillion dollars and rising under the recently busted Budget Control Act caps. It's a lot of money. Second, many of our efforts are counterproductive. So it's not as if this money is well spent. Oftentimes, our activities around the globe inflame the hatred of people there. We fight wars of choice, allegedly to promote American power or values in places like Iraq and, Afghanistan, or Iraq and Libya, but these have destabilized their respective regions. They've undermined our anti-proliferation and counterterrorism efforts, and they've even harmed those we were ostensibly trying to help. And while Libya was relatively inexpensive in terms of the human and financial costs to Americans, it was deeply costly to the people of Libya, and Iraq has cost the lives of thousands of patriotic soldiers and, like I said, trillions of taxpayer dollars. Um, and these are policies that are direct outgrowths of our primacist approach, but they haven't necessarily made Americans safer. And I don't think engaging in Syria would either, to the extent to which primacists would have us do so. And in many cases, we're spending these extraordinary amounts of money with few gains. So take the situation in Syria, uh, where we may or may not have killed about 15,000 ISIS fighters in one year, only to find ISIS to be about the same size now as it was one year ago and over $3 billion ago. Or take the $500 million that was allocated uh, to train Syrian rebels, and it produced, according to mainstream reports, what, five and not 500 or 5,000, but five? maybe four. Um, so uh, it's not as if our efforts are really producing the kind of, uh, of tip of the spear power we thought. The other thing is we also undermine the faith in our values when we're forced by the necessities, alleged necessities, if you will, of inter international politics to play ball with unsavory characters or what Ted Carpenter of Cato calls perilous partners. And when we engage with these partners, we often have to compromise our ideals. And again, I'm a realist, so I know that it's sometimes necessary. But when it's not World War II and the German threat, is it really best to think of the enemy of our enemy being our friend and worthy of compromising our values for? Another reason that primacy is such a problem is that it's largely unnecessary. Now, you might not get that watching Fox News or reading the Wall Street Journal. Um, but the United States is exceptionally safe today from traditional state actors. The country has an extremely favorable geographic position with two huge moats separating us from strong or threatening powers. And as John Mearsheimer talks about, there's, there's really this stopping power of water that is to our advantage. We're continent-sized with plentiful resources and the world's largest economy and also a large growing population. Moreover, our neighbors are friendly and comparatively weak, representing zero military threat. And importantly, the US has a military advantage that will remain unrivaled in the decades ahead, even if right-sized in accordance with a more realistic assessment of the world and our fiscal woes. We have a superior Navy, 
a superior air force uh, that provide an exceptional conven uh, conventional deterrent, and we have the ability to defeat attackers far from our shore. Not to mention we have a secure second strike nuclear capability to deter others from attacking the United States. So it's just extremely unlikely that state actors would dare attack the U.S. And here's a couple of interesting facts. So the United States has 10 aircraft carriers. The rest of the world combined has 10, and no country has more than two. And ours are technologically superior. The United States, as it's often pointed out, spends more on its military than the next seven to eight countries combined, and more than one third of total world military spending. And according to a recent Washington Post article, the United States spends 4.5 times what China does. Now, of course, the United States needs to be vigilant about threats, needs to have a robust intelligence capability, it needs to look out for explicitly anti-American terrorist groups and act upon those as necessary. But again, this is not a situation where we are, we are under siege, and the siege mentality that the primacists have is quite dangerous. Another reason why primacy is a problem is that it's ill-fitting for our our kind of, or the United States is really kind of ill-suited for this primacist approach. Our liberal values make it hard to do empire well. So if coin, for example, counterinsurgency is said to take generations, um, but our system and our political culture make it unlikely that we can fill the requirements of coin, should we really engage in, type, in those types of activities? And Americans aren't that excited about this. And, and I think Mike Dash of Notre Dame is probably going to talk about some of these issues in his talk. Um, but American public opinion is not excited about this imperial project. As Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group has pointed out, Americans continue to tell pollsters that they don't really want this. They don't want an open-ended commitment to risk American lives and spend American dollars. The other thing is, is that for conservatives in the room uh, and libertarians, uh, they understand that primacy has this fatal flaw, which is that it's based on a central planning fallacy that has proven false time and time again. We believe that Washington has the information, the cultural understanding, the know-how to tear down governments and to rebuild foreign countries in our image. But we've seen this horribly backfire in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and so many other places. We've fallen into Hayek's fatal conceit that man is able to shape the world around him according to his wishes. But the primacists, as Crystal and Kagan talk about, believe that everything depends on what we do now. But that is hubristic and untrue. And then lastly, primacy isn't sustainable. Our unipolar moment, as Charles Krauthammer called it, was unnatural. It was the product of a very unique moment in world history where a bipolar system collapsed into a unipolar one when the Soviet Union collapsed admittedly through some of our efforts, but also through its internal contradictions. And so the United States has been able to gallop internationally in the post-Cold War period, but that's going to come to an end. It's unnatural in the history of international relations. And when you put economic advances of places like China with the diffusion and innovation of military technology, it's only going to make it harder for the U.S. to sustain this unnatural position. Not to mention the fact that the United States is facing a budget crunch. Our current approach is expensive, as I talked about, and contributes to our financial insecurity. Now, while we should have a military second to none, the more we spend on this, the more it erodes our fiscal foundations. In other words, economic growth is so important, economic power is so important to our security, uh, that that's one of the reasons why Admiral Mike Mullen, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that these fiscal problems were the greatest threat to our national security because it undermines the foundations of our military might. So we have to get our fiscal house in order, and part of that is that we have to control defense spending. And this whole primacist approach is not consistent with conservatism. Um, I think John was going to talk a little bit more about this, but what I would say is that a foreign policy that's conservative should look at the world as it is and try to work within those constraints. And primacy, primacy though, is built on an unconstrained vision. If you think about uh, Thomas Sowell's 
constrained vision versus unconstrained vision. The primacists are really these uh, kind of a, a left-right uh, fusion of idealism at its core. It's not conservative. It's not realistic about human nature, about the way the world is, the constraints that we face. It's not prudential. It's revolutionary. It's idealistic. And this, like in domestic policy, gets you into all kinds of trouble. And so conservatives should reject this. So again, I think primacy, it's not in our interests, it's not conservative, it's not wise, and so we should avoid it. And that means we have to search for alternatives and we have to ask the right questions of the types of policies that are pursued today in the pursuit, ill-fated pursuit of primacy. So thank you. Well, thank you, Will. That was a, uh, a, an extraordinarily elegant summation of the, the, the realist position. So, very impressive. John, you've, you've been able to join us, and uh, so, and, and uh, 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 I, I think I'll, I'll just yield the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks for a great presentation, uh, Will. Um, I, uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to reflect a little bit about this question of human nature uh, to which Will alluded. Um, you know, as we've seen in the last dozen years or so, we've had uh, a foreign, this foreign policy of neoconservative Wilsonianism and interventionism uh, that has had so many counterproductive results. Uh, in reaction to it, we have seen both from the left and the right uh, a, 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 a policy that is partly influenced by a desire to disengage, uh, to uh, isolate ourselves a little bit from the world to one degree or another, and also to disarm. The reaction, I think, is a natural one, <clears throat> given the, dis the disastrous results, uh, uh, particularly of the Iraq War, but to some extent also the Afghan War. Um, it, this reaction reflects, however, a reality about public opinion <clears throat> in a democracy that merits some serious attention uh, from foreign policy thinkers. Um, public opinion is volatile. It swings like a pendulum or perhaps flies like a butterfly uh, to, to its next attraction. And uh, the less it is informed by a clinical and realistic assessment of the global strategic environment, the more likely uh, it is that the pendulum is just going to swing right back uh, to, to the place where it originally might have, or from which it originally came. Uh, I remember, for example, during the detente period of the 1970s, uh, how uh, people had high hopes in arms control agreements uh, and then all of a sudden after many summit meetings where President Carter and Leonid Brezhnev kissed each other on the lips, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan and all of a sudden people were, uh, you know, the president himself was surprised about uh, uh, about the uh, so about Soviet goals, uh, people were shocked and alarmed. Uh, there was a grain embargo. We boycotted the Olympics and all sorts of things like that. When, for those who were more realistic about the nature of the Soviet Union, uh, what else was new? Uh, this was something that could be potentially expected. Uh, we, it, it was an, just another variant of their different kinds of, uh, of aggression and advances in the world. <clears throat> then, of course, President Reagan came along. Uh, he had a serious policy of, of resisting the Soviet Union. Uh, but then when he embarked on his own summit meetings with arms control agreements, which the Soviets, of course, uh, 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 planned to violate even before they signed those agreements, uh, the, uh, you know, we had, we had, we had this, the, the uh, you know, champagne treaty signing ceremonies, the American and Soviet flags were flying next to each other over the White House complex, and a hundred votes switched against the defense budget. 
And then what you have is, is rather than a policy of consistency, you have a roller coaster defense budget si sending signals of weakness uh, as, as it happens. It may not have been exactly at that moment, but <clears throat> I believe that the lesson here is that national leadership has to be uh, consistent and it has to consistently educate the public about strategic realities in a way that avoids alarmism but also avoids psychological disarmament. This really is a question having to do with realism about the world and realism about the frailties of human nature. And which, of course, the latter of which is a central principle of conservative thought. And, and you know, recognition about the flaws of human nature is central to the, uh, to the, the uh, American political philosophy. But unfortunately, a lack of realism is what characterizes, uh, and, and it is a lack of realism oftentimes bordering on utopianism that characterizes several major schools of foreign policy thought in this country. First of all, liberal internationalism, which we're, we're, whose advocates believe that peace and security come from more treaties, uh, better international law, uh, ceding sovereignty to international organizations, more negotiations, dialogue, mutual understanding, and arms control. And of course, uh, so much of this, while all of these different things may be useful as diplomatic instruments, except in my opinion for arms control, which I think is almost always a failure, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the most successful uh, arms control agreement in American history was the rush bagot Agreement for the demilitarization of the Great Lakes. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> and, and it was successful precisely because it was unnecessary. Uh, but uh, these things are, are uh, uh, you know, these, are, these may be useful things, but they're not a panacea that creates peace. Uh, Neoconservative interventionism uh, involves a utopian and unrealistic view about the ability, as, as Will suggested, to shape foreign cultures as if they are like uh, balls of putty that can be shaped according to our will. Uh, as if culture exists, uh, doesn't as if culture doesn't exist, as if the habits, the traditions, the mentality built up over decades or centuries don't exist. Um, <clears throat> there is a liberal left variant of this uh, type of neoconservative Wilsonianism that believes that we can export uh, controversial social policies to the rest of the world without giving offense and without provoking uh, hostile reactions that, uh, um, and, and, and the perception that we're engaged in cultural imperialism. Uh, then, of course, there are isolationist tendencies and those of disengagers, uh, some of a, of a liber liberal left variety and others uh, within the libertarian school, but not uh, all libertarians, uh, who, <clears throat> Have, uh, who have recognized that U.S. attempts to be the arbiters of the futures of, of, of foreign peoples are often indeed seen as cultural imperialism. <clears throat> but uh, many times people believe that if we simply leave these lands uh, alone, that our hands-off policy will be reciprocated, uh, that there will be no power vacuum created that will be filled by bad guys, uh, and that hostility and aggression by uh, such groups as the radical Islamists will somehow subside. I think that that is utopian. <clears throat> um, Obama's policy of disengagement, um, I think, proves this. Uh, and, and the fact that there are, are powers and, and ideological movements that are hostile, you know, the fact is that there are powers and ideological movements that are hostile to the liberal political and economic uh, 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 order that the, that the United States has supported since World War II, and we have to be realistic about their existence. Then um, our policy of unilateral disarmament um, uh, and, 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 and useless and, and I believe counterproductive arms control agreements like that with, with, with uh, the New START agreement with Russia. Uh, these things are, 
you know, our, our policy of unilateral disarmament is not being reciprocated. Instead, it is being seen as a, a, a policy, uh, I think, of uh, as a signal, really, of, of, of provocative weakness. Um, I think that uh, uh, we see major uh, Russian uh, military buildup, huge Chinese military buildup, and the fact that uh, we've signed this agreement with Iran is, is in my view, uh, potentially prompting a, uh, a reaction um, within the region that could result in nuclear proliferation within the region, something that I don't think will augur for the stability of such a strategic part of the world. Um, there are, you know, finally, there is the realist reaction to uh, the recent policies. And I think, and as well as that of the school of restraint, and I think that both of these are very healthy correctives, and there's much to be commended about these approaches. But I would caution, however, that there are elements within each of these schools that suffer from a, ironically, from a lack of realism. How realistic is it to believe that we can permanently banish the moral and humanitarian impulses of the American heart and how they are manifested in our foreign policy. These are facts of life. They are as American as apple pie, and they cannot be banished or ignored as if they don't exist. They have to be managed, and that is the task of leadership, and, and leadership has to explain uh, how the concerns that arise from these impulses fit into the overall strategic context. It is here that I believe that when a monster arises somewhere in the world where, that, who, who is perpetrating human suffering, uh, that we have to, ex that, that the, the president has to explain uh, that there is a plethora of monsters out there and, uh, and that we cannot be dealing with all of them. Uh, this, is, this is the challenge of the, the, this new doctrine of responsibility to protect, R2P which is something which has a, a lot of, uh, uh, commands a lot of, 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 of interest and attention in foreign policy circles, and yet taken to its logical extreme, it could mean a formula for permanent war. Uh, this is something that leadership has to explain. <clears throat> uh, then I look, for example, at some of the, pro the while the, pro the, the progenitors of the restraint school uh, while they are offering a very valuable corrective to promiscuous military interventions, some of its uh, adherents have counseled the diminishment of our alliances uh, or our deterrent forces. And, and while I think that they are right, uh, that many of our allies are what uh, have been called uh, free riders or reckless drivers, um, <clears throat> Uh, we need simply to, we, I think that, that abandoning our alliances under the current international circumstances is not prudent and that they have to be managed simply better rather than dismantling them and sending signals of weakness and harming the credibil our credibility both as an ally and as an adversary. I think that we need to be much more consistent in our defense uh, policies if we want to maintain peace. The fact that we have not done freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea for three years and then we finally decide to do one within the last few days is, it has sent a signal of inconsistency and weakness. If we had been doing it all the time, this wouldn't be a big deal. It simply wouldn't be a big deal. Now it's a big deal. Now it looks like a provocation. It shouldn't be seen as that. We should, be, we should be able to help continue to protect the sea lines of communication. It's as if we, 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 we don't do this kind of thing in the Mediterranean for a long time. The Russians then declare that the Mediterranean is their, is their little lake. And when we some, send somebody into the Mediterranean, well, that, that'll all of a sudden be a provocation. The South China Sea is like the new Mediterranean today. What, are the, what, what should we be doing uh, proactively? I believe that we have to maintain a very strong deterrent force. Uh, we need to have a big stick. 
We cannot, I, I, I respectfully take exception with Will's, um, with, with Will's characterization of the relative defense spending. Uh, the Chinese have built the so-called underground Great Wall, 3,000 miles of tunnels through which uh, they, they can drag, uh, drive a truck dragging uh, a road mobile uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile um, launcher. Uh, 3,000 miles of this. This is a serious defense expenditure. I wonder how much it would cost for us to, to build something like that. I don't think that that fits within the statistics that have been conventionally cited about the Chinese defense budget. Um, I think that we need to be maintaining consistent defense modernization so that we can have a credible deterrent. Uh, I, the other thing that I think that we really need to do is, and, and, and maybe we can talk about this later some more, is, is massively expand our capacities to, to uh, exercise soft power in the world. That means a huge new effort to, uh, to conduct public diplomacy and strategic influence. Uh, the, the former functions of the U.S. Information Agency, uh, which have been uh, dismantled uh, pretty much uh, there's only a shadow of those former capabilities that exist in the State Department today. And this is uh, exchanges, uh, cultural diplomacy, which is strategic. People think cultural diplomacy is fluff. Cultural diplomacy is a serious form of international engagement that, 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 that inclines people to be more uh, interested in, in talking to us, in negotiating with us, in trading with us. Uh, it, we, we, never, we never talk about this, this sort of thing strategically. Information policy, international broadcasting, we're dismantling many of our capacities to communicate with the world. There's massive propaganda going on against the United States and the world, and we are and right here in our own country. The Chinese have just set up a new uh, radio station right here uh, that is completely controlled by Beijing, right here in the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, how the FCC ever let this thing get through is amazing to me. Uh, anyway, then there are the, the, uh, our, our capacities to, to conduct covert political influence operations, and that means being able to fight the war of ideas against radical Islamism, and that has everything to do, with, rather than dealing with ra radical Islamism as a military problem, as an intelligence problem, spending trillions on all of this, uh, we have done almost nothing to prevent the recruitment of new terrorists to the, the ranks of these organizations. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that is something that we uh, once knew how to do back during the Cold War. We should be reviving those capabilities. And it, and, and it almost, almost a lot of this stuff has to be done covertly. Anyway, I'm sorry for taking so long. No, 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 Thank that's you. great, John. Thanks very much. Now, Dan, uh, I, I think you might yes, I'll, have, I think have I'll some have other a, thoughts. A bit of an answer to that. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to George Washington University for hosting us again. Uh, and my uh, remarks will touch a little bit on both of uh, the previous panelists' comments, so uh, it should end up with a, a good discussion. Uh, as you've all seen, uh, the foreign policy debate among Republican presidential candidates this year has been remarkable for being both out of touch with what most Americans want and uh, rather unimaginative in content. Despite losing the last two presidential elections in part because of their aggressive foreign policy, Republican hawks keep trying to sell the public on their hostility to diplomacy, new and unnecessary overseas commitments, and deeper involvement in conflicts where the U.S. has little or nothing at stake. The Republicans' 2016 candidates are unanimous in their opposition to the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, despite what I think are its strong non-proliferation measures. Uh, almost all of them are in favor of establishing a dangerous no-fly zone in Syria that risks courting a war with Russia. Not only are these positions mistaken, but they reflect just how uniform and reflexively confrontational Republican foreign policy remains more than a decade after the Iraq War. The Republican Party in the country would both benefit greatly from having a conservative realist alternative to the prevailing hawkish consensus. And I'd like to outline here what that alternative could look like in practice and, and what I would like it to look like in practice. Uh, like many Americans across the political spectrum, conservative realists share an aversion to wars of choice 
and so-called humanitarian interventions. We reject preventive wars as reckless and unjust. We oppose the invasion of Iraq, but we're also appalled by the Obama administration's war for regime change in Libya, and now oppose its senseless involvement in the war in Yemen uh, led by Saudi Arabia. We take seriously John Quincy Adams' exhortation not to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. While we are also committed to defending the US against foreign threats without exaggerating the size or nature of the threats that our country does face. Truly vital interests should define the limits and goals of US foreign policy. And we should insist on distinguishing between vital and peripheral interests. Conservative realists see US strength and wealth as resources that need to be tended and husbanded carefully and preserved rather than frittered away in hectic activism. For these reasons, we are reluctant to embark on ideological crusades, and we're very resistant to trying to shape and control the internal developments of other countries. We're likewise skeptical of appeals to values that are aimed at dragging the US into crises where the US has no interest at stake. And rather than courting great power conflict through provocative responses, we're interested in reducing tensions and managing disagreements uh, with uh, states such as Russia and China. A conservative realist foreign policy requires, first of all, a careful reevaluation of what U.S. vital interests actually are. There are relatively few places in the world where the U.S. has truly vital interests that directly affect the security and prosperity of the United States. Outside of our own hemisphere, East Asia and Western Europe are the only parts of the world where U.S. security might truly be at stake. And the ambition and scale of our foreign policy should reflect that. This is a foreign policy more in line with what the American public is likely to support, it's less likely to provoke violent resistance and resentment from overseas, and it will be more sustainable and affordable over the long term. And cutting back on foreign entanglements is a long delayed and necessary adjustment that the US has been putting off for making for the last 20 years. That doesn't mean uh, abandoning allies, but it does mean shifting burdens for defense to the wealthy allies that can afford it, uh, that have been free riding on US security guarantees for decades. And doing that, we'll also seek to reduce, reduce US overseas deployments and scale back military spending accordingly. In keeping with this, we need to recognize that clients and would-be clients that expose the US to unnecessary conflicts or create tensions with other major powers are actually liabilities for us, not assets. And we should alter relations with them uh, to match that. Uh, the current involvement in the Saudi-led war in Yemen is a case in point. The current intervention in Yemen is a conflict that the US has joined out of a misguided desire to placate client states at considerable cost to our reputation and security interests. We should have no part in such conflicts, and it ought to be, we ought to be using our position as a patron to try to restrain our clients rather than enable their worst behavior. That doesn't require the US to have poor or adversarial relations with these client states, but it does mean that they would have to stop receiving so much support and indulgence when their interests and ours clearly diverge. Many client-state relationships may have to be downgraded as a result. But that would make clear that US support is not to be taken for granted and not something that we provided indefinitely regardless of the costs and benefits for the US. Avoiding additional entanglements and gradually shifting burdens to allies do not mean that the US would cease to be actively involved in international affairs. Not only would commercial and diplomatic exchanges continue as part of conservative realist foreign policy, but they would in all likelihood increase. That would happen as the US ceases to take sides in so many foreign conflicts and can put itself in a position to be a more effective mediator in international disputes. And it would be the result of seeking to have normal relations and trade with as many states as possible. Americans generally shouldn't be taking sides in disputes between or within other states. And for that reason, a US guided by conservative realism would be one that doesn't seek to demagogue or exaggerate foreign threats, nor would it cultivate hostility or adoration towards any other country. Far from advocating withdrawal from the world, conservative realists champion engagement through diplomacy and trade. The US should strive to maintain normal and full diplomatic relations with as many states as possible and should restrict or cut off trade with states only in the most extreme cases. Therefore, we should very rarely rely on sanctions as a tool and then only when they are targeted specifically against members of a regime rather than the civilian population. In general, we should pursue both economic and diplomatic engagement rather than rely on the overused tactics of embargo and isolation. And on principle, uh, to emphasize this again, we should refuse to take sides in the internal quarrels of other countries. We ought to respect the sovereignty of other states much more consistently than we have in past decades, 
and we ought to refrain as much as possible from destabilizing foreign governments or aiding in their overthrow. At the same time, we would refrain from propping up and subsidizing abusive and dictatorial regimes and would condition U.S. aid on how a government treats its people. If parties to international conflict request arbitration from the U.S., we should be in a position to act as a neutral mediator, and that means that we're not actively backing one side against another. We've seen the futility and absurdity of trying to act as an honest broker while providing lopsided support to one side in a conflict, and that should have no place in U.S. foreign policy. That could mean a potentially large and very active role for U.S. diplomats abroad, but not one in which the U.S. was attempting to dictate terms or promote a particular outcome. International engagement could not and would not cease, but would be of a very different kind from what we've seen. This is a conservative realism that is defined by its commitment to peace, its recognition of the limits of American power, and its respect for the virtue of exercising restraint in the use of that power. An essential part of practicing that restraint means giving up the habit of taking sides in each new crisis and conflict that erupts around the world. Those sorts of interventions, as we've seen, do nothing to make America or our allies more secure, but instead expose the U.S. to new and unnecessary risks and burdens. Foreign policy restraint best serves U.S. interests after more than a decade of prolonged and desultory warfare. We've seen the terrible and unnecessary costs that come from trying to lead a world that doesn't, in many cases, want or need that leadership. It's time for the U.S. to learn how to practice restraint. Thank you. And that leaves you, Corey, to So the philosophical high ground has already been taken by my colleagues on the panel. I'm going to try and have a conversation the other direction. So instead of Napoleonic law, which is the high philosophy that ought to guide a legal system, I'm going to take the English law perspective, which is case by case build up to a general theory. Um, because I think in foreign policy, it's very, um, it may be a better guide, namely, instead of coming in with a grand strategy, conservative realism, um, that, that the choices that you make in specific cases end up telling you what your strategy is, although your philosophical inclinations are guideposts. Um, and yet, I find an enormous amount to agree with my fellow panelists on, but I struggle to think about how it applies to the specific cases. So if, with your permission, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to give a little bit of my time at the end of my talk to ask each of the three panelists it's, to, apply it's their, mm -hmm. to apply their um, philosophy, their approach to conservative foreign policy, to the case of what do you do about Russia right now? Um, because what I thought I heard is that each of the three of you would have very different approaches. And I think it would be, it would, I know it would be useful for me. I hope it would be useful for the audience. But I want to say a couple of building block things before we get to that. Um, the, the first is, Everybody talked about Iraq, um, and, and you almost made it sound like the administration's choice was enthralled to the idea of American primacy. And my, I went to work in the White House. I wasn't a Bush partisan. I, I hadn't been on the campaign or anything. I went to work in the Bush White House after September 11th. And my recollection of everybody's at overwhelming attitude, the, the grand strategy that was driving them was actually fear, right? They, they did not want to have to go back to the American people a second time and say, we knew this guy, Saddam Hussein, was a problem. He'd been a problem. We fought him once. We took a third of his country. We've had continuous military operations going on in his country for 13 years or something by that time. He was in violation of 17 UN Security Council resolutions. He not only had uh, chemical weapons, he not only used him, them on his enemy, the Iranians, during their long war, he used them on his own population. Nobody in the Bush administration wanted to have to go back to the American people 
after September 11th and say, we knew all of these things and we chose not to do more. We chose not to actively manage this threat. Um, and that is, I think, an important place to where grand strategy gets grounded against the fact that the president's primary objective is the defense of the country. And several people mentioned that, um, that what American public attitudes on things. And I just finished writing a book about the, uh, the transition from British to American hegemony. It's a history that starts in 1823 and ends in 1923. And one of the really wonderful things about uh, being a historian is that you realize that we're not newly a country full of crazy people run by really mediocre talent and doing wildly inconsistent things. We have always been that country, right? Like, it's not news. And so we very often, as scholars, try and put a consistency on American policy that is not only not, not true to the history, it's not true to who we are, which is a rambunctious, free people who hold our, prize our own freedom highly and generally believe that's what other people want too. Um, and that motivates America to go out in the world. And my, my sense of American public attitude, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have said, I run a project at the Hoover Institution with Jim Mattis on civil military gaps in the United States. And we did the biggest systematic public polling of American attitudes on defense policy. I see Mac Owens in the audience, and he wrote a terrific chapter for the book. Um, the uh, American public attitudes are generally in line with, with what folks have been saying, right? They don't like to go out in the world. They think other people should solve their own problems. Um, and they want us, however, to have the ability to have freedom of action. And that's what primacy is. It's the ability to set the rules of the international order rather than have those rules imposed on you. Um, and if you want to have primacy, if you want to have the ability to determine your own fate and fortune rather than have it imposed on you by others, um, there are cheap ways to do that and expensive ways to do that. An expensive way to do that, it, a cheap way to do that is to tend the garden, to pull weeds as they start to grow. Um, an expensive way to do that is to have a tree that's blocking your view and have to chop that tree down rather than have pulled it up as a sprout. By which I mean to say liberal internationalism is about setting the rules of the international order getting others to buy into those rules. That's where treaties come in. That's where international organizations come in. That's where alliances come in. And in doing those things, we reduce the cost to the United States over time because people won't resist um, the rules of the order if they are consensual. And the great sustaining power of America in the world, the reason our hegemony has been so long lasting, you know, I noticed that you said that you know, it's not sustainable. But in fact, it's pretty sustainable, right? I mean, American power has been dominant in the international order for at least the last 70 years at costs that mostly the American people are willing to bear. Um, and so it is sustainable because our values drive a vision of the international order in which um, individual liberty and good governance create peace. That is what we actually believe. And Americans can't be persuaded to go out in the world in defense of a grand strategy like primacy. Right? My mom's never going to agree to do that. But Americans are motivated by seeing other people um, imposed on by bad governments, by circumstances, by evil in the world. Americans are motivated to go and do something about that. 
And in doing something about that, we create the very soft power that you were talking about, the influence over other people's choices, the, the magnetism. America has the ability to intimidate, but we also have the ability to inspire. And the fact that we care about what's happening to people in Syria actually does accrue power to us. Now, I think everybody on the panel would agree that accruing power isn't an end in itself. But the accruing of power, especially soft power, because it's cheap, it doesn't cost us what imposing our will costs us. Um, accruing power gives you freedom of action. It gives you that primacy. I want to close with my favorite conservative foreign policy expert, a quote from my favorite conservative foreign policy expert which is that the use of force alone is but temporary. It may subdue for a moment, but it does not remove the necessity of subduing again. And a country is not to be governed that must perpetually be conquered. I think that's about the best foreign policy guidepost um, that, that could happen. And it is, of course, from that famous British conservative, that father of so much of our own conservative principles, and Edmund Burke. And it adds to the poignancy that he made that comment about proper foreign policy in the context of criticizing the British government's repression of the 13 American colonies, right? It was us that were being imposed on at that time because we lacked the primacy to have freedom of action. And as we navigate the world, we tend not to do it by grand ideas. We tend to do it by a sort of English law accruing of little decisions about trying to advance freedom, trying to advance liberty, doing it when it's cheap enough to do it so the American people won't object, um, because over time, that builds an international order in which our values become the norm. And in the last 70 years, our values have dramatically become the norm in the world. People are yearning for what we take for granted. And that's actually a very positive world for conservatives. Well, that leaves, I think, a few minutes. Well, uh, uh, I your idea of the uh, you know question. yes i think Please that's an excellent tell me each um, of your three approaches uh, would have us yeah do on yeah let's start with 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 will yeah um, and i'll i'll be concise so we can get yeah. other questions um, a don't poke the bear okay so okay. don't further expand nato this is a foolish idea that primacists believe in um, a don't muck around in the internal affairs of states like the ukraine and other places that are outside of nato but inside uh, Russia's near abroad. And then third, rely on deterrence around credible commitments, not unbelievable red lines. That's admirably concise, and I would ask um, <laughs> the two remaining panelists to be as concise. Uh, 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 John. Well, I, um, I happen to be a believer in, the, uh, in NATO expansion, uh, at least as far as it went. Um, I think that the conclusion of the Cold War was something that basically ratified the notion that, that the peoples of East Central Europe want to be part of the West. The Ukrainians, the, even the ones in Eastern Ukraine uh, uh, who are heavily intermarried with, with, with Russians, voted for uh, independence from Russia. Uh, I think that the that this that the, the, the post Cold War order was something that essentially solved the problem of of, of the historic problem of German Russian competition over the lands between, and uh, and 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 has cemented those countries within the West where they want to be. Uh, I believe that it is one of the best investments that we have made in peace and security. It, uh, the fact that these countries, uh, the fact is that most of these countries ended up having uh, huge irredentist ambitions uh, and, and they were told basically, if you want to be part of the Western economic and security community, get rid of those uh, irredentist ambitions 
and, and be a good citizen and join our community, and that's exactly what they did, and that has augured extremely to the benefit of, of Western peace, uh, uh, international trade, uh, prosperity. <clears throat> so I think that for us to be abandoning uh, or, or even sending any signal of weakness concerning uh, uh, Russian ambitions in Estonia and even in other countries of East Central Europe would be mm -hmm. a huge mistake. I also okay. think it is not our interest That's... to be in, at war with, mm -hmm. with, with Russia over Syria. Uh, I think that, uh, that there are other, there are other mm -hmm. things that we can do over there uh, in, in Syria uh, that, that would, um, I think, help minimize the problems, the mm -hmm. global problems arising from mm -hmm. that. Right, well, and uh, very briefly, Dan. Yeah, did, I mostly I agree with uh, Will's uh, suggestions. Uh, just a couple more specific things. One, I, I would not be inclined to send any weapons to the Ukrainians with the ceasefire holding largely as it is since the, the whole point of sending the weapons is to try to restart the fighting and inflict damage on Russia. Uh, reinforcing existing NATO allies seemed to me to be perfectly acceptable and, and a reasonable response to Russian actions, uh, which have been illegal. Uh, but uh, I, there's certainly no reason to go beyond that. Uh, as far as Syria goes, uh, whatever the Russians are doing in Syria, whether it works out for them or not, it's not something that we need to respond to or, or counter uh, as it seems like we're doing. So well, I, my so, yeah, two cents yeah. are we should always be helping people who are fighting for their own freedom. That means helping the Ukrainians, that means helping the Syrians, that means when people are subject to repression and yearning to breathe free, that ought to speak to us and we ought to help create that international order. Well, but does, this is. But does that does that mean uh, does does that mean uh, uh, pulling the rug out from under the Shah of Iran? I mean, you know, when the, the, it's it's a prudential judgment as to which is the most liberal alternative that's realistic in some of these situations. Yes, it's very in Syria, important but you, you also know, make it sound like there's these George Washingtons running around <coughs> these places that just want to yearn to breathe free and and. The world is not so Manichaean with black hats and white hats, that we support the good guys and there's the bad guys. There's a lot of gray hats in the world, and we need to acknowledge that they don't need to be our friends just because they might be uh, opposed to a different gray hat. And, and so I, I just don't, I mean, I would love the idea that people yearn to be free like our founding fathers did, um, but I just don't think that that's what's actually going on. Of course, nobody's going to want it the way we wanted it. And George Washingtons are in rare supply on the ground, which is why so many countries are such a mess. Well, and well, yet. this is what's so interesting about this is that realism, it seems, you, you, uh, you all uh, sort of em embrace the idea, but realism can, as as Corey, you suggested, that uh, uh, the particular, the, the specific policies, policies, and even the approach to the world. Uh, 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 that realism dictates can be varied. I think we have time for just really one question, and uh, and you're the lucky, uh, you're the lucky one. Uh, Mike Dash, Corey, mm -hmm. just very quickly, I think you're absolutely right to emphasize the climate of fear after 9/11. You know, as an important uh, permissive uh, factor in the Bush administration's subsequent decisions, but what? What, cont what linked that real fear after 9-11 to the strategy of invading Iraq? And it seems to me your uh, subsequent uh, discussion of the assumptions of primacy uh, provide the direct link between you know, what happened and how we linked uh, a place that in reality wasn't connected uh, at all with 9-11 uh, to our larger global war on terror. Yeah, it's a great question and a really important one. I myself think that if the sanctions regime in Iraq had been eroding the way it eroded in 2002, if that had happened four or five years later, I actually do not believe that Bush administration would have invaded Iraq. So, so there's not, there is not a, a link between 9-11, between the grand strategy that gets you to 9-11 and the grand strategy that gets you to Iraq, the link actually is the fear. 
right? That, that prudential restraint, which I think all of us um, on this panel support, and I think probably everybody on this panel, I, I shouldn't speak for you guys, but I think it's pretty clear from what you said that, that um, all of us think we should have been more restrained um, in 2003, right? Um, I happen to think most of our wars are wars of choice, so that, I'm not sure that's, that's the right discriminator. But I do think in the case of after September 11th, there was a long shadow of fear on government decisions that caused them to be less prudential, and that's the Iraq case, um, where I think our interests would have been better served by utilizing some of the other means available to us rather than invading Iraq. Uh, if I can to Mike's Very question, well. I mean, I, I guess is it really the fear that drove it? Because before 9-11, the architects of the Iraq war were beating this drum. It goes all the way back to a lot of different statements made in the late 1990s. And so Iraq was a case where they took advantage of American fear. I don't believe they were motivated by it. Well, well, on that on 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 that note, we're going to break the panel up, and I don't know if 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 you uh, you all are, are are free later to answer questions, you know, informally from the audience. But uh, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.